And Yo, we're live and we're live and we're live. Welcome oh to the two. All right, guys, welcome to episode 21. I've got Mr. Sean Stafford today. What's going on, bro? Hey, mate, good to see you, Mr. Need Up 24 yes. 7, representing on the hat. Bro, listen, I'm just, I, it's just a pleasure to have a Captain America look alike, Fernando Torres look alike right in front of me. Do you get that all the time? All the time. Every single day, when he was when he was mate, when he was playing for Chelsea, yeah, um, it was one of those things where I would struggle to go a day without someone just randomly shouting Torres in the street. Oh my god! But you know what? At least he's a good-looking guy, though. Yeah, I yeah. Mean, if if it was, I mean, if they were calling you Diego Costa, you wouldn't be happy. <laughs> no, exactly. That's the thing. Like, we used to, we used to have that band. So we used to have a guy um, that we worked with who looked just like Sean Gota. Oh yeah, <laughs> we, we, we also go like feed the goat, feed the goat. He's like, mate, that's not fair. No. He goes, I'm better looking than Sean Goat. <laughs> Good man. All right, before we carry on, this is a question I ask everyone. Yeah, what is your Nando's order, mate? Do you, do you want me to let you in? You probably know this because you're you look like you're a Nando's aficionado. I am. Have, yeah. Have you have you heard of Perry Tamer? Okay, someone told me this on my last week's podcast. Okay, but I haven't had it. It's basically like barbecue. I, I'm not a fan of spice. The only okay. thing I like spicy is a picante. Okay, but, yeah. <laughs> um, but like, I'm, I'm not a fan of like spice on food. So if I get a Nando's, I want to be able to inhale it pretty quickly. Okay, um, yeah. I go Perry Tamer or, okay, or, nice. lem, or, or lemon mango or whatever okay, it is, nice. mango herb. Nice. But what do, what do you get? You get like a whole chicken, you get Perry Perry chips. What do you go for? I go for number one, two, three, four, five on the list. Just all the whole lot. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, no, I usually go boneless. So I usually go for the boneless tenders, maybe a little wrap in there. I'm a big fan of the macho peas. Okay. Who Bone, isn't? Boneless. You're, talk, you're, you're still talking about the food, right? Always. <laughs> Always. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Good man. All right, so, so what did you get up to last night, man? So it was so hot, wasn't it? Oh, I'm, I'm still it was, dying. It's ridiculous. It's barbecue weather. So we yeah. hosted, because it's like obviously with this whole lockdown thing, we haven't seen a lot of our friends for a while. Yeah, yeah. And so we hosted, like we've got a little garden, just showed you there. Um, and it's one of those things where it was prime barbecue weather. So yeah. we, we got basically both my son's godfathers and their missus over for a, for a barbecue. Yeah. A lo load of meat, load of Aperol. It just yeah. got, it started at three, finished at 11. Oh, I bet all you were thinking was, oh, I really can't be bothered to go on Dara's podcast tomorrow. <laughs> no, mate, I didn't even think about it. I didn't even think about it because you get carried away, don't you? Like oh, once, mate. once the, and we've got like these giant like red wine glasses and we were using them for the Aperol and it yeah. just, mate, it got, it got, it got done quick. I'm yeah. glad we've got a corner shop. We've got a corner shop. 150 meters away from my house. Of course you go, do. It's Dalston. It's Dalston, yeah. <laughs> I had to go there twice. Oh, good man. Like we, we ran out of Prosecco for the Aperol Spritz like twice. Is the, is the off license, are they Turkish? They are Turkish. Of course they're Turkish. <laughs> yeah, yeah. In Dalston, bro. Like yeah, I went yeah, yeah. to, I went to, like, so you know when all the refugees came in, like all the Turks and the Kurds came in like uh, the late 80s and 90s, they just threw them all in Dalston, Hackney yeah. and Tottenham. So yeah. that's why, I don't know, how, how long have you been living there? We lived in Highbury for eight years, which is about okay. literally a mile west. Yeah. And yeah. then um, we've lived here for four years. Yeah. So do you know in Dalston, do you remember when there was London riots? Yeah. Do you know the only area on Dalston High Street wasn't affected? Do you know why? It was the, it was the Turkish Mafia, <laughs> the, the <laughs> protection agency, right? They, they, they got their bats. They stood in front of their shops. Yeah. And they waited for looters to come loot. And they weren't letting anyone. They were on the paper because everyone that lived in the area were like, the Turks saved us in the area. Yeah, like, yeah. Yeah, go on. Yeah, do that. It was the North London, like Enfield, Highbury, yeah. Yeah. Holloway. All that area didn't really get touched. Yeah. But you know what? I, I would have never guessed that you would have lived in Dalston. I would have always thought you'd be where I am, in Wandsworth or something like that. Nah. So I'm not actually from London. Yeah. So I, I'm from Hampshire, which is like a... Do you know where Southampton is? Do you know where the Isle yeah. of Wight is in the middle of the UK? Yeah, 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 yeah. But literally right in the middle of the UK, south coast, Hampshire, that's where I'm from. So, And you went, um, you went to school there and everything? Yeah, I went to boarding school when I was sort of seven till I was okay. 18. And then from there to university and then from there to London. Okay, this is a great topic. I want to know this. What is boarding school like, man? Mate, it's wicked. 
Really? I was, yeah, I, I loved it. So basically, okay. I went there with my brother when I was probably too young. So I was seven years old, which okay. is very young. Um, my dad's in the army, so he was traveling around a lot. Okay. And my, and my brother has um, like learning difficulties, so he's got dyslexia and all that sort of stuff. So it was all the moving schools when he was sort of 10, 11, was yeah. starting to impact his sort of education. So they yeah. kind of said, look, it'd be a really good idea to put him into a, a stable environment. Yeah. And I was like, if he's going, I'm going. Sick. And yeah. So, and so we both just went. Yeah. And it's like boarding school gets a bit of a bad rap, but we had yeah. a really good one. Like we had a very good boarding school. It was basically like a massive country house. Yeah. With like loads of your mates. And you and were you, you don't go on, mate. I was gonna say, were you ever were you ever upset that your parents sent you to boarding school? Nah, not really. Yeah. Oh, I think good. my brother. I think my brother was. I was probably too emotionally undeveloped. I was like seven <laughs> years old. Yeah. For, for, for me, it was just literally like I get to play sport all day yeah. with like, with like other mates, and then because yeah. my parents often lived in different countries with the army. Yeah. On weekends, I get to go home with either stay in school and have like a you just, again play sport all day, or yeah. you get to go to your go to your mates' houses. Mm. It's wicked, mm. mate. It was great. Yeah, it was and that's the thing. It was in the middle of the country. Like acres of land. There was a golf course on the at the school. We had like swimming pools, mate. It was oh, it was that's, legit. That's pretty. <laughs> I'm not gonna lie. It sounds better than my East London school. I'm not gonna lie. To yeah, you. <laughs> yeah. It was. I, I literally have zero complaints about yeah. my uh, my boarding school experience. It yeah. was it was very good. Apart from yeah. So we were an all boys school. That's origi- what I was gonna- or- originally. Okay. And then in my year, so when my year started, they merged with a girls' school. Oh, no, okay. no, really? Because, no, because so they merged with a very, very small girl school. So that there, there was still, I think that the girl to guy ratio was like seven to one. Well, sorry, the oh, guy okay. to girl ratio was like seven to one. And then when I left, they bought another huge girl school. And then it went to like four to six guys to girls. So when I left, it just got flooded with girls. Oh, and I was like, you are okay. fuming. Oh, it's what it is. You are fuming. It's what it is. It's all right, man. It's all right, man. I mean, being a famous bodybuilding influencer like yourself, man, you're probably getting DMs left, right, center. I know you're married, but... I'm married, yeah. Happily married. You're happily married. But I bet you're still getting that, innit? You must. Do you know what? If you look at... The funny thing is, if you look at my demographic, yeah. they're eight, 87% men. Shut up. Yeah, it's legit. My, really? 87% men. If you think about the content that I put out, yeah. It's like, it's workout content. It's sort of, you know, my lifestyle stuff, bit of family, yeah. you know, it's basically content for guys and, you know, a very, very small percentage of women follow me. So what I've got 250 odd thousand. So that's the 26. Yeah. I've literally got like 30,000 birds. That's it. And then the rest, and then 215,000 yeah. men. Yeah. But still, 30,000 females following you is a lot better than most people. <laughs> <laughs> maybe, maybe. But I don't, I don't, uh, mate, the, um, the, the funniest thing I got, the funniest thing I got was when, you know, when they send you a pic? Yeah. When they send you a pic and it's blurry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And, you, and you, you have to, because you don't follow them. So it's like, you have to you know, like, accept the message and then it comes in. So I was yeah. sitting there with my missus and I was like, what is this? I don't, yeah. I don't recognize this at all. I clicked on it. And it was uh, a woman had put, a well two hairbrushes yeah in in both um in both in both holes yeah no and and it was funny my missus was just like that's amazing oh and i said God. i said how do we reply and she goes and i just said it just it just makes me want to brush my hair <laughs> <laughs> and what was that username that sent you that <laughs> <I'm joking. laughs> blocked is what it was <laughs> so all right so when you were in boarding school that seems like it would be is it quite disciplined yeah yeah it, would it be, was right? it was one of those ones where we went to a very good boarding school in terms of it wasn't crazy academic so yeah. it wasn't they didn't they didn't hammer everyone with like you must do your you must get four a's at a level but we had like a really nice family environment like That's if good. i'm if i'm looking at my best friends i would say of my 10 best friends five of them are from school okay That's do you know good. what i mean and okay. I, I, that that was 25 years ago so okay. you, you really keep, you know, we grew up, we grew up together. You, we, we Zoom chat every month, you know, we yeah. go to each other's weddings, that sort of stuff. So it's, um, it was a really, really nice family vibe. And, yeah. we literally, and we literally just played sport all day. 
yeah. it was a very very sport focused school like yeah. we had good sports teams and everyone just played sport in 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 your school because i always find that uh with like the scene that you're in like the bodybuilding uh, the rugby scene and all that because yeah, yeah. I, I know through like paul lima james jade all those boys do you was was football a thing at your boarding school or no no it wasn't was it no it's rugby it's rugby, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because it's because they say because they say rugby's like not a rich boy thing, but uh, a a board that it is, isn't it? Mate, so they say that they say that football is a sport played by gentlemen, watched yeah. by thugs. Yeah. And rugby is a sport played by thugs, watched by gentlemen. Oh, really? Right. Yeah. So it's um it's one of those ones where I think a lot less um sort of state schools play rugby a lot more like private and public schools, sorry, a lot more public and private schools play rugby. So that's just one of those things. It's, yeah. I think it's definitely changing as I think a lot of grassroots rugby, especially with the RFU is really trying to get younger, just people from all walks of life into rugby. Cause it's such a good sport. It's yeah. such a good sport. It, I'm not going to lie. It's not really my cup of tea. I respect the players. I yeah. watch it. And all I can think was bloody hell mate, you don't get paid enough. <laughs> When you when you compare it to football, right? When you compare right. it to their football, and they get paid three hundred grand a week, and, yeah. and you know they get touched here and they roll around, and you're yeah, like, yeah, yeah, yeah. was that no the, dig at me? <laughs> <laughs> now, what was I watching? I watched the game the other day, and it was uh, it was embarrassing. Like someone was just backing into him, and he literally touched him, tapped him yeah, here, yeah. and the guy goes down holding his face. I'm just like, yeah, mate. It is. I, I hated those players because I was a total opposite. I was always the one like really sliding. Not aggressive, but kind of aggressive. I'd always like whisper weird shit into their ear and stuff. Yeah, yeah. Center back. What but, in uh, Turkish? In Turkish. <laughs> <laughs> Depends where I was. Yeah, sometimes yeah, yeah. it's Turkish. But like, what's uh, what's mad is um, the the biggest difference I've found in uh, people that are in the rugby scene and football scene was I've kind of been in environments. Well, I've obviously been in the football change rooms for years, from like the age of seven to like literally twenty five. Yeah. And I've also met a lot of people in rugby. And what the people that I've met in rugby, the egos are so bad with football. Oh, really? No, no, with footballers oh. compared to rugby players. Rugby players are like when I first met like Jade, for example. You know, you know Jade? Jade. Uh, tall white friend. Don't worry, he's me and James's best mate. You'll know. Him. Oh, yeah, I know the yeah, face. Yeah, from yeah, it, yeah, 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 yeah. He also looks like Captain America too. <laughs> oh, I, I know. Yeah, he, came, he came to the launch party of the gym. Exactly, yeah, here, yeah, here, yeah, here, yeah, here. yeah, yeah. So, here when I first met him, they were rugby lads and they were so welcoming and so, like, which was yeah. great. And uh, Paul Emer's told me so many times as well from him going into a change room because he's gone from football to rugby as well. Yeah, and I was, I couldn't believe it. I was like, are these guys, are, are they being fake or do they actually want to have banter with me? And the level of banter is like, oh, uh, it's, it's like, it's filthy. Know, it's mate. It's like talking about your girlfriend, your mum, your dad, and in football, if you said that, you'd get slapped. <laughs> yeah, it's mad, isn't it? It's crazy. So, but go on, carry on. You go. You're gonna say. Do something. you um? Do you follow James Haskell? Uh, I don't, but I've met him. I always banter James. I always go, oh, "You're just a shit version of Haskell, just to wind him up." Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> just to wind him up. But but Haskell yeah. is the perfect example of someone who's just like banter just banter 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 and he'll just but at the same time incredibly welcoming to like everyone he meets and you know you look at him and he's like six foot four 20 stone of neck and you're like yeah. he is a pretty intimidating guy but then as soon as he opens his mouth and i think it's a, the same with a lot of rugby players is that a lot of them are very softly spoken rugby teaches you a level of discipline and respect yeah and, and also like brotherhood like at the end of the day you're literally smashing each other up on the field and then you shake hands and have a pint afterwards which, which is, is which yeah. is great amazing i think one of the problems with football is because there's so much money involved the egos within the changing room and that's why well the, the football teams that do amazing are the ones that are like brotherhoods yeah, right? yeah you know and to be honest i've played for so many clubs and that's rarely ever happened like maybe one or two out of how many years of playing where i felt like everyone was a whole family but you yeah. meet you meet rugby lads and it's just like straight in. They like it's like when they're grilling you down with the banter. It's like they're taking out all your insecurities, which is such a powerful thing. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Did yeah. you feel, did you feel that when you first started playing, or it was one of those ones where you kind of 
I've been playing for a long, long time. It was kind of like, I've been playing for 20 years. So it was one of those ones where you start very young and it just kind of becomes part of the, part of the fabric. Yeah. You know, I think, I think when you get your first cap for the, for the first 15 at school, like they, there's like initiations and that sort of stuff. And it kind of strips you down because then they, they make you uncomfortable because yeah. they'll say like, you've got to get up in front of everybody and like sing a song or yeah, 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 tell yeah. a joke. So it's literally, it's making you very vulnerable and then like almost taking your fear making you realize it in front of your your new friends and your team and then it's gone and then you realize everything's okay and they still treat you the same and nothing's going to be that bad so i can see the mentality behind initiations it's kind of like it does strip you down and expose you in front of your team shows you grow from it shows your weakness so shows your weakness which is good i guess yeah so you went from rugby years of rugby and boarding school and stuff and you transition to bodybuilding. Now, with your bodybuilding career, I'll be honest, I don't know much. I know yeah. I've seen pictures of you doing big things on stages, but when it comes to like bodybuilding federations and this, yeah, and yeah. I, I actually don't know which one's the top, which one's this, yeah. which one's that. So how did that transition happen from rugby to that? Well, it was one of those ones where I was playing rugby. So I, by that time, I, I played a bit of sevens. So I was doing a little bit of jazz. I started working in a gym. And I got an injury and it was one of those ones where I thought, you know what, enough's enough. It's time to try something else. So once that injury kind of healed, I was just training in the gym. You know what it's like when you're training in the gym and you've got nothing to train for. Yeah. It's just a bit boring. And, it's a, and, it, and one of my colleagues said, there's this competition called men's physique, which is like a small version, like a, a beach body, small version of bodybuilding. Should we do it? And I was like, fine we've got three months to do it let's just enter and see how we go yeah and so we both entered we both trained dieted sort of went on t nation read all you can about like getting cut for shows and stuff went out did your fasted cardio trained five days a week ate broccoli and chicken and fish and just properly that old school bodybuilder stuff yeah and and stepped on stage she ended up winning her division yeah which was which was bikini yeah. And I ended up winning my division, which That's was, so, yeah. So this is like the British championship completely blagged it. Um, but I think I had a good physique from rugby and from years of like lifting heavy and doing that yeah. sort of stuff. So um, I just basically took away all the fat and whatever was still there was, was all right. Yeah. Um, and then, so I won that show, which was the British championships. And then that kind of got me an invite to the Europeans, okay. which was like, which was like in four months time. So I was like, all right, so I might as well. Yeah. And so I just said, okay cool and I put my head back down ate a little bit more trained a little bit harder got better stepped on stage in Iceland for the European Championships Mm. and ended up winning that and so it was a bit like okay maybe I'm actually pretty good at this and it was still it was still when the division was quite new so the stand the standard probably wasn't as good as it is now okay um but then so when I won the Europeans, I won something called a pro card, which means you can then compete in the pro division. So if you go to a show and you win yeah. it, you win money. Yeah. So like okay. you, can get, you get paid. You get paid yeah. to be a, a physique athlete. Yeah. And so the next available show was the World Championships, which was in Toronto in Canada. And Sick. I think that was, that was eight months after the Europeans. So I then thought, okay, I've obviously got a little bit of talent here but I'm kind of winging it. I'm kind of blagging it. And so I said to, I said to myself, I'm going to get a coach. I'm a personal trainer. I believe in, in 100%, coaching. 100%. So I said, I'm going, to, I'm going to go and get a coach and hire a coach. And so I spoke to Phil Lerney. And I was like, oh. Phil, I was, I was like, Phil can, you, can you keep an eye on me and make sure I'm not going to fuck this up? And he was like, yeah, no worries. So I worked with Phil for eight months, kind of in the run-up to this World Championships. Went, flew to Toronto like standard was much much higher 50 60 people on stage and ended up winning that as well shit so it went it was it was one of those things where i went from like an injured rugby player to a pro to the pro world champion in 18 months that's crazy it was mental like didn't didn't expect it but you know what and then you're there and it's kind of like damn like okay so i was at the top of the tree and it was kind of like let's just try and hold on for as long as possible sick yeah, it was a bit it was weird it's good because you know what when you think you know when people like although you say like in um in that short amount of time you're at the top but 
I think when people might look at that and go, yeah, he, he, was, he, he done it this quickly, how? But when you think about it from what you've just told me in the last like 15 minutes, you went to boarding school, discipline. Dad's military, discipline. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You played rugby, years of sport, discipline, consistency, all of those things. And people will tend to forget all of that and just go, yeah. how did he do it in that short period of time? But really, you actually had probably one of the best foundations to go yeah. into a very disciplined sport like bodybuilding. Yeah. yeah. And, right? and it's also like, I think what a lot of people forget is I was 28 when I entered my first show. So I had 10 years of gym yeah. and, and sport, like 10 and good level sport, like not yeah. just having a kick around in the park, you know, yeah. professional sport. So I was like, you know, good level sport, heavy gym, for 10 years before I even thought about competing. Yeah. So yeah, there's a lot that goes into it. Isn't it, isn't it crazy when you go from like a field sport, right? Uh, I, I just remember this transition, like my strength, everything in the gym went up so much because my body was no longer tired. Yeah. Of, like, you know, you, you transition from doing, we were training three, four nights a week. I'll probably clock at least five to 10 K each session. Oh. Easy, easy, good intensity. Eating, I'm kind of looking not not fat, not skinny, not really lean, like skinny. I don't know what I'm looking like. You yeah, start, you start concentrating on not aesthetics, but just lifting more, training harder in the gym, and your body's like the pain that you get in the gym after all the suffering you do on a field doesn't feel that bad, does it? Nah. It feels especially, like especially, especially with rugby. Like oh, you wake yeah. up, you wake up, you wake up the day after a rugby match or two days after a rugby match, and you're literally your neck, your knees, yeah. your back, just been battered. Yeah. yeah. But you know, like um, you said, like full old school, you went old school with the bodybuilder sort of stuff, right? Which I like because I like yeah. old, old school bodybuilders. I don't like the new pricks that come along. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I know what you mean. Do you know I what I mean? A hundred percent. And I was, I was very lucky that the division that I competed in was, it was called fitness model. Okay. So, so it's basically like men's physique. So that's, you're not going to be one of those 300 pound monsters just eating. And for me, when I stepped on stage and won the world championships, I was 83 kilos. So I'm six foot one. I'm not, yeah. I'm not, I'm not small. No, no, no. I was, I was, I scraped 13 stone. Jesus. And I, and I, and I but I looked like I was hundred kilos because the lines, the definition, the, the proportions, everything that goes into it, the balance of your physique. Yeah. Which is a lot of it's genetic. And I was just going to say that <laughs> like, I, I have super broad shoulders, super deep lats. I've got a natural Christmas tree in my back. Yeah, like, yeah, 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 yeah. So it's one of those things where genetically I was very gifted to be that division, to be straight yeah. to that division. And because it was so new, I was kind of like the first one or one of the first guys to come through it. Yeah. And yeah, it was, it worked out all right. So, so when did it, when did things start popping in the sense that you got, cause I, I actually, I know your face before I met you and looked into your profile because I was like, where have I seen this guy? Where have I seen him? But I've actually seen you of years of seeing your face in yeah. fitness posts and this and that magazine where in my head I was like, I don't know him, but I feel like I know him. I've always said that guy looks like Fernando Torres, but then I actually yeah. met you. And, <laughs> and then I was did. like, and then I went back and looked at one of my friend's Instagram and I was like, oh shit, he's got pictures with someone that was telling me about this Australian fitness model in Australia. And yeah. then I was like, is that them in LA or something? I was like, that's where I've seen his face. Cause there was a, I forgot his name. Uh, Nick. Uh, Nick Cheadle. Nick Cheadle. Yeah. Yes, him. I don't know him personally, but a lot of um, the people I worked in in the gym were always talking about him. They're like, yeah. he's doing this. I'm like, bruv, the fuck are you lot talking about he's doing this? Why don't you go try and do the same instead of talking shit yeah. about someone that's doing well? And then when I looked at his profile, this is years ago. That's where I recognized your face because I saw yeah. people I'm used to. And then I was like, what a small fucking world. Like, it's crazy. Mate, so with social media and with fitness the world it gets smaller and smaller and smaller because you know you'll follow 600 people on your channel who six degrees of separation like yeah. nick's nick's the 
my Australian counterpart. So I, I work for a brand called Optimum, who, who do yeah. sports nutrition. Yeah. And Nick is the Australian version of me, or I'm the Australian, or I'm the English version of Nick. Okay. So, yeah, yeah. Um, so we go, we do a lot of events together and, and that sort of okay. stuff. Okay. Sick. So did, so at which point did you start getting the followers, the sponsors start calling you up? When did that happen? So I think, I think what, what actually happened was it, it coincided with the, introduction into physique sport so when i started competing yeah. what i did was instagram didn't exist back then so yeah. i i did it on facebook so i had a facebook page and i was every day i would write what i was eating and i would write and post a photo of my workout or a video of my workout and then you know post it and go and then as I started to win things and there'd be a little bit of publicity, I started to get some magazine covers, do some interviews here, some interviews there, the, the Facebook page kind of kicked up. And I, I think I went from about 1,000 followers when I won my first show to just under a million when I won my, my, my first world championships. On what, Facebook? Yeah, I've got a million followers on Facebook. What the hell, bro? Yeah, I know. Please tell me you're using it. <laughs> I'm not. Oh my God. Are you joking? I'm too busy, Darren. I'm too busy. <laughs> I'm too busy. Or, or maybe I'm not so busy. I just don't care enough about it. Oh, mate. I know. Yeah. It's, it's disgusting, I know. I actually think Facebook's more, way more powerful than... It, I think so. There's, there's more users on it. 100%. Yeah. That is... That is but it's also, it's also one of those things where I enjoy Instagram more. Like, Instagram's a bit more connected. It's a bit more current. It's a bit more fun. Whereas the, the Facebook was a bit, you know, it got a bit oh, boring. Yeah, old school. Uh, old, yeah. Old school, but because the audience on Facebook is so different. It's, it's more of a, like, my mum and dad and that, they have Facebook. But yeah. for them to get Instagram, it took them a while, and they only got it because of me. Yeah. Or they, or they wouldn't have got it, you know? And also, like, when the algorithm changed. So there was a time when I would post... I would post a photo or a video and it would get a million views or hundred thousand likes or whatever. And then almost overnight, boom, I post a photo and it gets 300 views, 300 I, likes. And it's just kind of like, do you know what? Yeah. The juice isn't worth a squeeze. Or like I'm, I'd rather focus on something where it's a little bit more consistent. And I think they just want you to pay to boost your posts on Facebook. And I'm just like, for me, it's, I'm not about that. Yeah, they um they did that for sure, and they, I think that what they wanted to do is push everyone to Instagram. Maybe. Yeah, and I think I feel like that's why they did it, and now that's why when when you see like because I've never ever actually bought anything off Instagram, but off Facebook when I see stuff, I'm like, oh maybe maybe really? I really yeah like but Instagram I've always found like nah swipe 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 see you later see you later see you later Facebook I'm a little bit more engaged a bit like yeah. how I am when you go watch YouTube or something like that, but obviously not as yeah. So at the minute, how 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 you getting on with? I call it the Corona coaster. The Corona coaster. Do you know what? It's. I was going to say. So obviously, I have two gyms, and we were expecting the news that we were going to have. We're going to be able to reopen again on July fourth. But Boris threw a bit of a curveball at us and said that pubs pubs are a better option than gyms oh. to open. So we're we're still sitting on the sidelines, which is a little bit deflating. So we we've been closed for what will be four months Shit, so bus business wise it's been a bit of a bit of a struggle yeah but at the same time we've had beautiful weather like this oh, is all, almost like the entire time we've had sunny days yeah and and having the keys to my own private gym where i can just go in there and bang gym do you know what i mean i've i've i'm i've added 50 kilos to my squat I've added absolutely nothing. <laughs> <laughs> but it's, it's one of those ones where I thought like this year I wanted to get stronger. I wanted to be as strong as I look yeah. rather than just looking strong. Yeah. Um, and so I focused it on my squat and on my deadlift and I've added about 50 kilos Sick. To, to, to both um, Sick. For, for a five rep max over lockdown. What is your back squat? Five RM? Uh, 157 and a half. Yeah, that's sick. That's good. For a that, six foot for a six foot one guy who had to start again in January, yeah. so I started with an empty bar and yeah. learned a new technique in January, and it's just been slowly creeping up. But, oh, really? Yeah. So how I, come? I, um, just because whenever I used to squat, I used to get a bad back, I used to get bad knees, and it's just really I didn't enjoy it at all. And so I hired a powerlifting coach, and he taught me how to low bar squat. I was going to say, yeah, low bar, yeah. Yeah, low bar squat, get my shoulders in the right place, hips back. <laughs> Basically taught me how to squat heavy properly 
Yeah. And then it's just been one of those things where for three months I squatted three times a week. Yeah, that's good. It was great. And I followed a really simple, it's called starting strength program. Yeah. Just went in, trained three times a week. I did 45 reps for the entire workout. Yeah. It was just, it was just powerlifting moves, but the squat yeah. was in every session. So yeah. Yeah. And my legs got bigger. I got stronger. I feel better. I'm fatter. Yeah. But, yeah. but fuck, you take that, right? Nah, bruv, you don't worry, man. You look good anyway. You look good. Right. Don't worry. It'll be all right. When you when you were going when you were doing uh, three squats a week, yeah. What was the volume like throughout the sessions? Was it low volume? Five. Mate, it it was three by three times five reps. Oh, sick! That's that it. is that That's is the it. best. That is the yeah. best. So three sets, three sets, five reps, three times a week. Monday, Wednesday, Friday, done. Yeah, yeah, hundred percent. I much then, prefer intensity, low reps to high volume. I hate high volume. I'm a bitch. Yeah. I'm a bitch. I'm like, what? Ten? What? Twelve? Nah, this is long. <laughs> I can't do that. Yeah. So I'm now doing. I'm now doing a program called Five Three One, which is a Jim Wendler program. So it's literally I do five like. One week I do five reps, the next week I do three reps, then the week after I go five, three, one rep max, and then you do as many, like you rack it, and then you do as many as you can on your one rep max afterwards. you like wave loading. Yeah, it's great. Yeah. And then a deload, and then a deload week four, perfect. Yeah, sick, sick, wicked. It's, it's, isn't it weird? Because you've got a good foundation of strength from high volume, because you've built muscle, therefore when you transition to lower reps, because you're less exhausted, Mate, like, you can just push at a different level, right? It's, and this a, game, it's a game changer. Yeah. Like, I've always been a bodybuilder, like smashing out that 10 to 15 rep range, like 20 sets, 20 yeah. sets of workout, you know, yeah. bro split, and yeah. just going into big lifts. My body's gone. Thank you. Like, yeah. it's, it's grown. I feel stronger. I look thicker. I put yeah. on weight. Like, I, um, I went from 88 to 92 kilos. Yeah. All yeah. muscle. Yeah. Yeah, oh, but you know what? You're probably you probably you, you definitely look way more dense, but like you just feel so much stronger. Because when you're doing high volume, fucking chest press with like twenties, I'm sorry, but you look, it's a bit of a bitch boy thing. You, it's way better uh, having dumbbells for six going forties. You know what I mean? Yeah, like, yeah, yeah. You know what I mean? For six and like bah, drop it and they look over like how many reps did that guy? Do? I'm like, don't worry, bro. I'm an athlete, <laughs> isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> That's what I remember when um, I remember when James came to. City Athletic in Victoria yeah. for a training session. And he, like, I was doing bodybuilder workout. And he'd get to he'd get to six reps and done. Like, he would yeah, just yeah. Hit, hit a wall at six. Yeah, yeah. It's some, all... some people are built that way, yeah, right? Yeah, Well, when I was playing football, I wouldn't go over, like, I wouldn't go over six either. It's just, it's just there's no point. You get too much lactate buildup when you go high yeah. volume. And then when you go high volume with the lowest weight, I feel so weak because... I've never, you never feel doms like that. And I yeah. think it, that's why it's good to like periodize, right? Because then if you went in like next year, if you went, okay, you know what? I'm going to go a little bit more high volume due to the strength work you're doing now, yeah. your high volume intensity is probably going to be a little bit higher. Therefore you're pushing more volume with more intensity and you're going to be bigger and stronger. Mate. So I think the biggest mistake that people make when they train is to not use percentages of their max. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? As in yeah, pe yeah, yeah. people just go in and say, Oh yeah, I was using 14s last week. That's where I'm going. Mate, always work it off a percentage of your max. So like yeah, when yeah. you when you come back round, like you you people hide behind reps rather yeah, than yeah. rather than work into their true potential. And yeah. it's one of those things where that's something I've learned this year with my own training is that yeah. if you stick to the right percentages of your max, the results yeah. just come and you hit that you hit the numbers. Yeah, yeah. I hear you. I hear you. So are you um are you pissed off about Boris? About the whole, would you, What would you have done? Because a lot of people online have been like, you should have opened the gyms first. That's way more important than the pubs. But then when you think about the whole nation, how many people actually go to the gym compared to how many, peop how, how many people would probably suffer from mental health because they can't go and eat somewhere with their family or something? What would you have done? So if you look at it, so look at gyms, pubs, restaurants. And if you were to survey the population and say open two, yeah they would have said pubs and restaurants yeah do you know what i mean so i get it like i 100 percent get it yeah what i think is probably a little bit naive and i don't see the logic behind it is you know they're saying from a from a gym owner's point of view they're saying we have to, all these restrictions so we all have to wear ppe we have to super sanitary we have to have protective screens up there has to be like a 
everything has to be socially distanced. There's a maximum number of people you can have in a gym. You can't have the toilet facilities have got to be regulated and there's no shower facilities. So there's massive restrictions they're putting in on us. But it's kind of saying you can go to a pub and there's, there's no talk of PPE. There will be, there's no talk of um, the social distancing. When you're pissed up, there's no chance. No Mate, chance. I, I'm, in a, I'm in a pub. The music's so loud. I can't hear people from two, two feet, two centimetres away, let alone a metre. Yeah, so yeah, like, yeah. So there's, I, don't, I, I just don't see how it can be effective. If it was me, I would have just said, open it up all, but you've got to hit these things. Yeah, I agree. Because, I mean, even that, social distance in a pub, what are you talking about? There's people that have not seen the other sex for months, and they're going to be in a pub boozing. Everyone is thirsty. Everyone's thirsty. Girls want it. Boys want it. Girls on girls, boys on boys, <laughs> whatever you fancy. Yeah. You know I mean, so it's not... And, 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 it, and it's Pride Month as well. So everyone's just out. <laughs> everyone's just out for a good time. Yeah. The sun's at London when the sun is out. Is the best. Is the best city in it's the, the world best. by a mile. Thank you. You know what? I'm so glad you said that. I have this argument with James all the time. And he's like, what do you mean? I'm like, bro, listen, London is the best. I said, number one, let's just say today, if the shit was open, you can go there for food, have a few drinks with your mate. You know what? You're bored. Tomorrow, go fly out to Spain, mate. When you're in Australia, yeah. I love Australia. I love Australia. It's great. But you just can't do those things there. Yeah. That, that, mentality, that mentality of, you know what, let's just catch a flight and let's just go somewhere doesn't happen. But you go for a nice walk by the Thames in the summer in London, everyone's mood is just... Mate, there's a, there's a vibe. Yeah. You, you hang out near water or near green space in London when the sun is out. Yeah. The, the, the brunch culture, the pub culture, the beers culture, the sport culture, just the, like where I live in Dalston, it's just such a diverse community, like yeah. the music, the food, everything. It's just, mate, London is the best. And then we've got the shopping, we've got the connections, we've got the culture, we've got theatre, we, everything. London has it, all. To, has be it fair, all. to be fair, that is one thing I miss about that side of London, because in Wandsworth, around here, you don't get that sort of vibe. Do you know yeah. what I mean? You don't get that sort of vibe. In Dolson, like you can, like I was at my cousin's the other day on Caledonian Road. Yeah. Like had a, had, had a few drinks. We went for a walk around there and you see people that you know, you see Turkish, Jamaican shops, jerk chicken, Turkish food, Indian food, and this and that. And it's, and it's actually just like such a good vibe. And, and it helps you understand other cultures as well. Whereas yeah. when, you, when you're living in places like around here, and I see the kids playing out, and even kids outside London, I'm always like, fuck, I wish this kid would be in a school with like more black kids, more Turkish kids, more Indian kids, because when they grow up, they become way more socially aware. Yeah. And I'm, I'm sure you live in, in a more diverse place than probably where you were raised in like a boarding school. Yeah. Your mind probably just went, fuck, this is crazy. This is like a different world, right? Yeah. And it's one of those ones where like, my, and my son's going to go to school in Hackney. So like my son, my, my son starts school in September and I'm, I'm almost in no doubt that he's probably going to be in the minority. Wait, Do you know what I mean? Like, that's a good thing. <laughs> yeah. But, but he, but he also doesn't notice like yeah. his, like he's got, he's got black friends. He's got Turkish friends. He's yeah. got mixed race friends. Like he, and he doesn't really care. Like he's, you know, his, his teachers, his, his sort of care workers black and it's never, it's never been a thing for him. And I love that because I can't, one of my members of staff is um, is like six foot four Nigerian guy, yeah. no, six foot six Nigerian guy. And when Lucas came into work, he just went up to him, Jermaine, and starts you know talking to him. And he's like, most kids are petrified of me. Oh, he's, he's and he's like, it's, and I was like, it's probably because you're six foot six. And he goes, well, this, you know, maybe that. But he yeah. goes, it's it's nice that you know your kids suggest they can go up and they, they don't necessarily have any of the sort of stereotypes and stigma of it being something different when it's because around here it's not, yeah. which is, which is great. Yeah. It's, it's, I think that's, that's why those areas, and you know what, it's so good for him being around that at that age. Like it's gonna, it's gonna be, so what you call him the cub, don't you? You call him the cub. Oh, yeah. The cub yeah. That cub's going to turn into a lion with that sort of mentality. I'm telling you like being around all of that because once you are around that, you don't see people as any different. I remember my mum. My mum told me when they first came into the country, to um, I think they moved to Stoke Newington. Yeah. And there's a big Jewish community, loads of huge, black people. Yeah, huge, huge Jewish community. Yeah. yeah. 
And my mum was like, when they came, I was born here, but my sister was born in Istanbul. So when they came, um, my sister, when she first saw a black guy on the bus, apparently she just reached out to his skin and just like touched, touched it, it, touched it. And like the guy, was, he loved it because they could tell like my, my lot were refugees. And it's crazy, yeah. something small like that just brings like a, a connection yeah. to people to each other. And I think once people now, especially with everything that's happening now, if people are open-minded and not actually scared to have conversations or step out of their comfort zone to talk to someone and ask questions, I don't think we'll ever have this problem because I sometimes yeah. don't even think about it because I'm like, in my head, I'm like, that's not even a problem in my head. So I kind of don't like putting myself in a head space where yeah. I, I have to prove a point. Do you know what I mean? 100%. And it's one of those things where I would never say, I would never say to somebody that, oh, I don't see colour, you know, because yeah. I've heard so many people say that. And I'm like, I think if you say that, it's, it's a bit disrespectful because, because you, you, the colour exists there. And I think if you're just turning a blind eye to it is is a bit naive and it's also not appreciating and understanding their culture, their heritage and how their life is different to yours, whether it's right or wrong. So this, you know, I think this whole Black Lives Matter movement that's been going on over the last sort of six or seven weeks has been brilliant. Like, yeah. you know, we took, we took our son to the march, the first one that was in Hyde Park, yeah. just so he could experience it. And, you know, and it, it was really nice hearing him talk to his grandparents about what he was doing and why it's important for us to go and show support. Yeah. You know, I've got, and it's the same, like I've got a gay brother yeah. and we go to Pride and yeah. the amount of hate we got for taking our son to Pride. Just you like, what? that is crazy. It's just social media, just social media bullshit. And I'm just like, do you know what? I want, I want my son to grow up in a world where we're, we're proud of everyone and it's yeah. okay to love everybody. And there needs to be that level of respect. And I'm like, I have a, I have a brother who, you know, he lived the first 35 years of his life straight. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Had got married, had kids, and then yeah. realized that it's just a, it's not, it's not who he is. And yeah. to have the courage to come out and to, to live a life. And he's got remarried now to a, to a bloke. Yeah. And it's like, it takes a lot of courage and, it's just kind of saying how much happier would he have been if the status quo had been okay that 20 years ago yeah he, he had the courage to come out rather than just five years ago so it's yeah i think it's uh, you know being a dad and 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 living in london i think it's important that we we raise our kids the next generation to yeah. come through the, the right way and as you said open like open-mindedness is the yeah. key do you do you like being a dad love it yeah I best thing say. ever mate best thing ever yeah, I could what, go on. I could tell you just brightened up when I said that. Go for it. Go on. It's one of those things where, like, I've I've had a dog. We've got a dog for uh, our dog's like eight, and it's like, <laughs> and, and and before before you have kids, like, you, if you said to me, "Oh, Sean, what 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 do you love your dog out of ten? What would you love your dog?" Yeah. And I'd say, "Yeah, be be a nine or a ten. Yeah. And then you have a kid. <laughs> yeah. Ask me what I love my dog. It's a four. <laughs> so it's like you're like it, it's one of those levels where you don't really appreciate what true love is until you have like your own little spawn yeah like the fruit yeah. of your loins with someone else that you love like it's yeah it's wicked. And, he, and he's such a character you've met him a few times yeah 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 he is it's brilliant it's brilliant and you know what i when i since when i was 17 I, since i was 17 i've done a lot of traveling i've just like took off football this that australia and my mom and dad would always get so upset and my mom and dad would always say, look, listen, you, you will never understand this feeling when your child moves to the other side of the world, not knowing when they're coming back until you have your own child. And yeah. I'm like, yeah, cool, whatever. But from all my mates I've spoken to and what I see with relationships like yours and your sons, I can see how hard it would be for a parent yeah. to just literally go. And it also makes me, I don't know how, how some people just just leave their kids <laughs> it's, it's, it's cr crazy right i'm like in my head i'm like how do you have it in you to let go of yeah. your kid obviously everyone everyone has their problems everyone has this everyone has that but and i always say this to my friends that like when they when they fall pregnant i'm like dickhead wear a condom then <laughs> if you don't want a kid <laughs> if you don't want a kid wear a condom mate it's not like yeah. it's not that difficult is it no it's really not <laughs> and, there's, and there's, there's lots of things you can do to not have a baby. There's, there's lots of different ways you can mix that <laughs> yeah, to, to yeah, not have a baby. Yeah. <laughs> um, so it's, yeah, it's something that was really interesting was I read somewhere that 
until you have, and it's, it's something that I spoke to my dad about, it's like, until you have a kid, yeah. you don't appreciate how much your dad loves you. Okay, yeah. Which is yeah. like, it, you know, because we, you know, we've asked, yeah, dad, yeah. Yeah, but yeah. It's yeah, like, yeah. And then you feel it towards your own son. It's just kind of like, it, it gives you, it puts it into perspective how much your dad loved you yeah. or must have loved you. Yeah. So it's a, it's a nice, it's a nice thing. It kind of closes the loop. Yeah. And seeing, and seeing grandparents with grandkids is, yeah. is it's amazing cool. as well. Yeah, I'm not gonna lie. I, I, I'm excited to breed at some point. <laughs> and until, until that point, you'll just have fun trying, right? But have fun practicing. <laughs> yeah, hundred percent. That's I've got to make sure it's right when I do it. You know. <laughs> yeah, and the thing is, you don't have to do it too young. Like we were, what were we, thirty-two? Yeah, thirty-two when we got pregnant. Like, yeah, it, I had to make the decision that with the bodybuilding and the you know, because it's a very, very selfish sport. Like, I don't think I could compete at the level that i was competing at yeah and and have a family yes I because agree. it's just you have the focus that you need and the, the amount of dedication and just downright selfishness that you need and focusing on on what you need to do to, to compete at that level and I, I thought like i've won i've won everything i need to win i've enjoyed yeah. it it's been great time for me to move on and start the next chapter of my life and that's when we decided to start a family yeah we I mean, got a family it, you got a good you got two gyms doing good business like yeah. you you made it you've gone clear but you know what it's not i wouldn't say that uh to say it's that i really enjoy my life do you know yeah. what i mean like it's it's great i live in a i live in a house that we can afford um I, we have a little garden i, I yeah. get to do this sort of stuff it's super fun yeah I've got great i've got great mates i love coming yeah. to work i've got 50 people who work for me like it's just yeah. it's amazing yeah that's good would you um ever i i'll I always have this conversation with my mate. Same sort of mentality, I'm assuming, with yourself as well. You find it ever, you, you find it hard to stop or see where you could stop. You, yeah. you can't, can you? And I bet that would have been so difficult deciding to have a child when you have a mindset like that. Because yeah. I'm like, in my head, in my head, I'm like, I don't know when I could ever settle. I don't know if I ever will. But yeah. like, do you find that sometimes difficult when to like, okay, you know what? I need to, I need to switch off for a bit for this week. I need to just switch off don't think about what I'm going to miss out on or lose on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Is that difficult for you or? It, I think because there's always a lot of uh, balls juggling or plates spinning. There's always yeah. multiple things going on. So it's quite difficult to either let all the balls drop or just let all the plates spin by themselves. Yeah. Um, I think there's a time where there's usually a cutoff period every night where it's phones down, phones away. My missus, we're not allowed phones at the dinner table. So there's little things which is kind of like keeps some of the family time sort of sacred. And yeah. it's one of those ones where over lockdown, that time when we're not on our phones, has, it's moved from 9 p.m. onwards to 8 p.m. onwards. So, so we're off our phones at 8 p.m. down and you can kind of enjoy that real interpersonal stuff. Yeah. So, I think so, but I think it's also just appreciating. Jamie Alderton did a post yesterday, um, which was about the fisherman and the and the businessman. Okay, I and it's, see, it, it was I super interesting, and it's exactly kind of it's a really good thing to just be aware of that there was a guy, a businessman, sitting on a pier, and there was a fisherman, and he comes back, and the guy's got like three big fish, and the businessman goes up to him and says, "How long have you been fishing for?" And he goes, "Oh, just a couple of hours." Um, he goes, well, "Why have you stopped?" He goes, I have, enough, I have enough fish to feed my family. I'm then going to go home. I'm going to play with my children. I'm going to play a little bit of guitar. I'm going to have a nap. Um, I'm then going to get up. I'm going to go down to the village. I'm going to catch up with my mates, eat some food, drink some tequila, yeah. and then go to bed and then get up tomorrow morning and go and fish for a couple of hours and feed my family again. Yeah. He's like, yeah, but you can you know, I can teach you how to catch more fish and then you can buy a bigger boat and be able to catch more fish and get an employee and then you can yeah. do this and do that and you can have a limited company and then you can sell it yeah, and make a lot of money. And he goes, what, so that I can go out in the morning and play with my kids and have a nap with my wife and play guitar and all the things that I'm currently doing Yeah. now. Yeah. So it's kind of like, I think there's, a, there's something beautiful about people that can appreciate the good things in life that they have and not always have to take it for the next level, take it to the next level, take it to the next level for the sake of it. Yeah, when no. really, if you know, all the things that make you happy are present right now. Yeah. That's, um, I think that's, that's a very fair point. And I think pretty sure the whole of the Mediterranean lived like that. <laughs> <laughs> pretty and, much. and you know what? 
I'm pretty sure they're the ones that live the longest too. High, higher, highest life expectancy, highest quality of life index, yeah. everything. Yeah, everything. Like my, my grandparents, uh, both my grand, one of my granddad died when he was 96, the other one 94. And yeah. he was smoking since he was like 16. <laughs> Man. you know <laughs> it's crazy and like you think about it mom, at one point in his 80s they were trying to get him to stop but my mom was like i reckon he'll die quicker if we get him to stop smoking yeah. just, like, right. just let him be he loved his gardening he loved yeah. his cigarette he would nap twice a day oh, that. yeah and like that is it and he loved every minute of it and I've, that is that's such a that's such a fair point, man. And we don't, we don't, we actually don't need much. We don't need much money at all. But I think living in Western society and especially the influencer, Instagram, all of that stuff, we get so carried away, don't we? I get carried yeah. away. I'm like, Mate, no, it's I'm easy not. to do. It's easy to do. It's easy to do. And also because Instagram is, and social media is very much looking at what other people want to show you. So it is, it is very, and it, I'm not saying it's necessarily like a look at me, look at me thing. Yeah. Um, but it is very much putting putting up a slideshow and trying to get people to engage with it, to like yeah. it, to do all yeah. that sort of stuff. Um, well, it is. It. It's all it's all Instagram. Anything you post is you're posting for attention. Yeah, <laughs> it is. It is when yeah. you think about it, you know. So, yeah. but yeah, and that's the thing. Like I think we can you can frame it different ways. So you can say, oh, you know, I'm. I want to put out valuable content for people to follow and, you know, I want to help them with their training and their nutrition and et cetera, et cetera. But you're hundred percent right. Yeah. It, you're, you're producing content for people to consume. Like, and therefore it, as a consumer yourself, when you're scrolling through people's feeds and when you're scrolling through the channels, it is very, very easy to see what other people are doing and to think, Oh, I should be doing that. But I'll be honest with you. I was scrolling this morning and a friend of mine, who's with the same agency had did, had an ice cream ad yeah. on, on his page. And I was like, he's getting, you know, he's probably making good money for that. And I was like, I should, I should have an ice. I love ice cream. I should have an ice cream ad. I was yeah. like, you know, I was like, you know what? I've got enough stuff going on. Like, <laughs> yeah, I, could, yeah. I, could, I could, I could go and buy a fab if I want to. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> yeah, I, yeah. I, could, I could enjoy a twister without having to get paid for it. Yeah. So yeah, yeah. It's, it's, it's really easy. And sometimes you just have to check yourself and be like, do you know what? Don't be a cunt. Like, yeah yeah you're, you're, you're all right like what you've got is amazing just be yeah. grateful and good things if you put out the good energy the good energy yeah. will come back and don't always cover what other people have 100 percent. because and you know what the funny thing is since my mentality has been like that more things have happened to me like my yeah. my, my dad he's very much like that he's very relaxed he's always like it'll be okay it'll be okay I remember when we were younger, like when we had less money and stuff, I'd be like, dad, do we need to pay that off? He'd be like, don't worry, man. The money will come. Like, <laughs> so yeah. relaxed. And the weird thing is, it always did. <laughs> he was so relaxed about it. He always, he always gave, obviously, the money didn't come through his energy, but he was so, well, maybe it did, but he was so yeah. chilled about everything. And he just kept doing all the simple things, showed people respect, uh, loves what he does, whatever. It just, one way or another it kind of comes back to you. And the more relaxed you are about it, I feel like it opens more doors. Yeah. You know what I mean? I think you're right. I think you're right. Yeah. But um, it, was, it was great having you on. Mate, it's been an hour. Right. That, has, that has flown by. That has flown by. That was, that was a wicked, that was a wicked episode. I, mean, I really enjoyed that. Um, can you please tell everyone where they can find you, your podcast, everything, please? So, they can so on social media, if you want to find me on Instagram, it's at Sean Stafford. So S-H-A-U-N-S-T-A-F-F-O-R-D. It's the same on Twitter. Um, and then on Facebook, it's Sean Stafford Fitness. Um, and then the podcast, which we are going to get you on when the studio oh, reopens. Sick, yeah. Um, it's called The Dad Podcast, and that's on all the kind of podcast stations that you can find. It's, uh, it's one of those things where we, do, similar to this, we get people in, we just chat everything from like, fitness fun fatherhood all that sort of stuff yeah sick wicked that's how you know he loves he, he loves his boy he's got a podcast a dad podcast yeah, that's yeah, how, yeah. i can tell that's how much you love being a dad but um, thank you for coming on man i appreciate your time and um i'm buzzing to come on your podcast having a beer mate so yeah we on a fr friday afternoon it's free beer in the studio oh sick.
classic. And it's right around the corner from Soho House, so we can just go there and go to the little rooftop afterwards, have a little burger. Listen, as, as, long as, you have a mem- as long as you have a membership, because I haven't. <laughs> we'll, be, we'll be fine. I'll sort you out. I'll sort you out. <laughs> Good man. Wicked. Thank you for coming on, guys. If you've listened to this, make sure you check out his page. Better subscribe to the channel. Tell your friends, or I'll come for you, yeah? I, I know who watches and who doesn't subscribe, all right? Peace, love. Thank you very much for listening.